Good morning. I'm Reverend Deborah Falk, minister here with Calgary Unitarians. We bid you welcome, who come with weary spirit seeking rest. We bid you welcome, who come with hope in your heart, who come with a longing for connection. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your sexual or theological orientation, wherever you are on your journey of faith and meaning, we bid you welcome. If you are here for the first time, we invite you to stay after and join us during coffee time. Welcome this day to the virtual home of Calgary Unitarians. Wherever you are, please recognize those on whose traditional land you may be. Here in Calgary, I acknowledge those of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, the people of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Sitsika, the Kani, and Kainai nations, as well as the Tsutsina and the Stony Nakoda First Nation, consisting of the Wesley, Bearspaw, and Chiniki. We also recognize that the city of Calgary is home to the Métis, Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We acknowledge that we are all treaty people, all respecting and honoring our relationship with each other and with the land. We come together to create beloved community, a community of radical inclusion that guided by our Unitarian Universalist principles and purposes seeks to grow in wisdom, welcome and deepen relationship, and act for a just and sustainable world. When we gather, we create a sacred space. We make it tangible with our intention and by lighting our chalice. A chalice lit in our midst holds the warmth we offer each other sheds its light to brighten the lives of those in its circle and beyond, is a beacon of love and justice, its tiny flame representing the pure light that shines within each person, brought together for this hour. Holding this intention, we light our chalice flame. Today is a very special service, inspired by April being National Poetry Month. Our reflections will be offered by poets, and the music chosen is also thus inspired. Our director of music, Jane Perry, just might have more to say about that. Good morning. It's good to be in this virtual space together. Our first song of the morning is called In Time of Silver Rain with lyrics by the African-American poet Langston Hughes. Mr. Hughes, amongst other things, was responsible for early innovation in jazz poetry. I should also, also mention that the music for this particular song was written by George Walker, who was the first African-American composer to receive the Pulitzer Prize for music. This is not a hymn that we sing frequently in our congregation, and yet the lyrics and poetry are so beautiful. So if it's not one you know, feel free to listen, feel free to speak the words of the poetry as I sing, or join me in singing. The lyrics will be up on the screen presently for you.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Sheila McMaster. I'm the Director of uh, Religious Education here at the Calgary Unitarians. And it's a fantastic morning. I have my windows open and the sweet spring summer air coming through. And I woke up to the smell of bacon and I thought, who is the lovely person in my house making me bacon? I'm so excited. And I got up into the kitchen and I realized the neighbors are having bacon. No one at my house is having bacon this morning, but I'm, I'm glad to share that morning bacon ambiance uh, with our neighbors. So good for them this morning. Um, you might be wondering, what are the children up to this week? Well, this week, uh, they're going to be celebrating uh, Beltane and learning all about the pagan May 1st celebrations. And the youth are going to be working on their pride parade ideas and having extended check-ins, which they always really enjoy. Um, and this Sunday, we're also talking about poetry. And uh, we had a special guest, Poet Toto, come visit the children a couple of weeks ago, and all the children wrote some poems. And um, Toto was really great. He went through uh, poetry techniques like alliteration and end rhyme, and we wrote some poems where we wrote five words, then three words, then two words, then five words. And the kids were all amazed at how their poems turned out. And I even had some, some children send me extra poems during the week about springtime, which I really enjoyed. And I'm, I'm impressed with all the talent that there is out there. Uh, the other side of poetry is that it's really personal. And so it's, it can be hard to share <laughs> with everyone. And so when I said, are there any children who'd like to share their poems on Sunday? And they all said, mm-mm. We're happy to share it with you, but we're not going to share it on Sunday. And I said, oh, but I really want to share some poems with everyone. And so uh, my daughter, Morgan, who's nine, I said, can you help me out? And she said, okay, mom, I will write a spring poem for you to share on Sunday. And so she wrote a poem using all of our different senses about spring. And I'm going to share it with you now. It's called A Spring Poem. Morgan age nine. The smell of spring is in the air. I hear the birds chirping. I can see the flowers bloom. I can taste the rabbit in my mouth. I thought that was a really great poem. Thank you very much for sharing, Morgan. Uh, and the other poem that got submitted to me was by Arno Baruma. Uh, many of you may know Arno. He often is the one who fixes the elevator lifts for us when we're in our building. And he has a little sister. And when she was five, she wrote a holiday poem. And I think he was about 12 when she wrote it. And at the time, he thought, oh, what an annoying poem. But as he thought about that poem, as the years went by, it became his favorite poem. And so now every year, he reads that poem at our holiday times. And I'll read this to you. It's by Ellie Mae Baruma, age five, written during the holidays. Some stores are open. Some stores are closed. Some stores have Boxing Day posters in their windows. So thank you very much, Ellie Mae Baruma, for sharing that poem with us as well. Um, I'm just so thrilled that we're looking at poetry today because it has a way, words have a way of really reaching our hearts. And that's, that's what I'm looking forward to today. Back to you, Deborah. When we gather together, whether in person or virtually, we take time to acknowledge joys and concerns, sorrows and milestones in our world and in our own lives. Each Sunday, we light three candles. The first one is a global candle. And today, I light it for Nova Scotia. And in doing that, I wish to share with you the prayer that I offered as part of the interfaith offering to Nova Scotia. Spirit of life, known by many names and yet fully known by none, Words are not adequate to express our grief, our longing to offer comfort to those whose lives have been forever altered 
by the loss of a loved one. And so we bring our hearts also broken by the tragedy of this senseless act of violence to join yours at the altar of the love that embraces us all. May you find courage and hope to face your tomorrows with the cherished memories of your beloveds for comfort. Knowing you are not alone, the whole country grieves with you and a bigger love holds you. That was my prayer and we light the candle in recognition of all of those touched by this violence. There are so many concerns these days, so many concerns in the wider world and also in our own community. This morning, if you have joy or concern, I invite you to write it in the chat box. There is a member of our caring team who is making note of all of the joys and concerns so that we can respond to you. For now, for all of the concerns spoken aloud and those held in the silence of our hearts, we light a candle. There are, of course, joys in our community as well. That the COVID virus tests that have happened for our members have all come back negative. And a personal incredible joy, it was 10 years ago yesterday that this congregation voted to call me as your minister. I am so grateful and I continue to deepen our relationship. For the joys spoken aloud, either by me or in your own home, for those held in the silence of our hearts, we light this candle. I have known poet and storyteller Cassie Welburn, known to many of you as Kathy, for the 10 years I have been in Calgary. And over the years, we have collaborated on many services. She serves on the worship arts team and so brings her gifts and passion, oh, and her incredible humor to those deliberations. In our long range planning of services, we chose this week to honor National Poetry Month. Little did we know at that time that we would be in these times. And it has created an incredible opportunity. As Cassie and I talked about an altered service, she mentioned so many poets and spoken word artists who have had to cancel all of their engagements. This led to the thought of creating a occasion for that to happen. She then spoke with fellow poet Sherry D. Wilson, Calgary's poet laureate, poet and spoken word artist extraordinaire, as well as a force of nature, for nature and for justice an educator and a bit of an instigator as well, who this year received or will receive the Order of Canada. Well, Sherry D got excited about the possibility of this morning and suggested inviting another poet and friend 
Louise Bernice Haff, Sky Dancer, a Cree elder, past poet laureate of Saskatchewan, to participate. I feel so blessed, she said yes to the invitation. Were we in person, I would offer her tobacco, as is the protocol when asking an elder to share their wisdom. Given the current gathering format, today I will place that tobacco offering on the chalice table, trusting it will be accepted. This month, is our theme is wholeness and poetry month theme is a world of poetry. So our poets offered this morning's reflection on a world of poetry keeping us whole. It is with honor and deep respect that I welcome these wonderful poets to share. Welcome to a world of poetry and welcome to our guests, Shirdi Wilson and Louise Bernice Haas. So delighted to have you with me. And to all you secret poets out there, I know you're there. <laughs> welcome to you all. We're from the League of Canadian Poets, which put on every year uh, a, a world of poetry is the theme for this year's April is Poetry Month. And you can find all kinds of really great poets reading their poems, especially on poems of healing. Just go to poets.ca and you'll find a world of poetry there. Another great place to celebrate uh, writers is the Story Dispenser, which the Central Library has. Many of you might have been to the coffee shop and discovered that just by pushing a button, you can get one, three or five minute stories or poems. Right now, you can't do that. Uh, those are celebrating local poets only. Wherever that story machine is in the world, they celebrate the local poets there. But there also is an online. It's called shortedition.com. And it's a lovely idea to celebrate local poets from around the world in English and French anyway, translated perhaps. So just go and read. If you've got a short attention span, it's, it's lovely and it's amazing what they can do in one minute. I've been uh, working my life with new Canadians, refugees and immigrants from all over the world. And so the word migrant has always resonated a lot with me. I have been tutoring families lately in English. And uh, this one boy really wanted seriously a long a uh, series of lessons on English grammar and punctuation. So I came to give it to him. And here's his poem, Coming of Age in a New World. He is all punctuation, this new student, dancing on the balls of his feet in his sunny kitchen, two months fresh from Iraq. I have new words, he shouts, tilts his head, spiky one side, the other shaved. Long gangly body sprung a rhythm of black tapered jeans, knees bent in impossible angle, loose cotton t-shirt springing to life the graphics of skull and bones. I have a friend, he says. We are the bones. New music, new haircut, see? His smile a flash of praise. My birthday today, I am 13. My father says I can have all of this, he waves his hands. An eagle rising, a shot of grace. I learn new moves, you can't stop me. I dance to the stars. It is legal, his father asks. How could it not be legal, I think? I have brought the notebook rules of English grammar that I'm about to open, but the boy turns his head so I can see the strand of hair left spiraling down his lean neck like a rogue semicolon. 
Cool, eh? Right now, there's not a lot happening in the school yards. And I think of usually May and June, especially June coming is a, a big school bells ringing out and all of the double recesses that they have. It's a secret, by the way, they have double recesses in June. So I kept thinking, how is spring gonna possibly come with these empty schoolyards that I see with their lonely little black and white soccer balls blowing in the wind. And I also think of that great story of the hero Glooskop from the Mi'kmaq tradition who is the person that goes and brings summer back from the other side of the world every spring. How can he do it now? Where are the animals to help him, the loon and the whale? Perhaps they will still appear. How summer comes to Canada. Who will kick the soccer ball out of the schoolyard chain link fence and tumble down with it like a hungry bear awake from the winter sleep down to the river, find the ring of bright water, land with a splash and roll across the surface, breathe in the swell of bird song beneath the baritone sacks of bullfrogs and blare like a horn in the distance. You might even catch the ear of that tattler loon who carries tales out of school all along the waterways. Follow her, just listen as she throws a sheet of music over the lake, a symphony so wildly hypnotic, even the whale hears and obeys, and in some distant ocean is this very moment hurtling north with flocks of cheering geese and other gleeful companions, not wanting to miss a single word she spills like secrets from the beads around her ebony neck. Anyone can catch one. Loon has a hundred stories and more. Just listen to these undocumented migrants flying across borders, families in tow, swimming through inlets, crawling along the highway ditches, hitching a ride on the human body. Watch as these little ones awaken with new fragile wings, inching ahead of a canoe as fishermen's lines steal a kiss of cutthroat trout under the hard gaze of a blue heron stepping out of the water to call, to call of the bullfrog, bullhorns, frog horns. Wait, you can't put that to music, but she can. Remember, just listen. To grass grow, the moan of mosquitoes, the ripening berry moon haunting as smoke blows towards us from distant fires. We are one world with each in breath. Can you hear the beat of wings fill up the sky, birds blackening the air, hurtling past to jam up trees, fences? Their eyes on you, daring you to let go. Feel the wind lift, carry you away, find yourself in a crackle of lightning. And then it's gone. A blood red sun hangs between setting and rising, looking back on us with disbelief through a sky so unrecognizable, even the giant winter could lose its way. When the lonely bugle of the bull elk begins, I'm longing to hear the sound of a school bell again, its familiar hammer in the distance. Thank you. What I've heard has been very beautiful and moving. This first poem, The Pandemic, 
My dog sits alongside an injured junco, wings flutter ever so slightly. On the eastern crocus hill, a fox, a fox's half-eaten carcass, clouded eyes, gaping mouth, lies lengthwise as if still on a run. In Nova Scotia, the RCMP sift through ashes of homes, gently remove the 22 scattered victims, their gun-riddled bodies left by the lost soul who impersonated as one of their own. In Saskatchewan, two years ago, in early April, 16 people whose lives were cut short in the Bronco bus crash left their grieving families to endure this heavy weight. They've moved into, into this forbearing. <laughs> Throughout the world, COVID-19 infects the unsuspecting. It lives on surfaces its sinister grasp waiting to climb hand to mouth to lungs. We are held in lockdown as we grapple with what we face. One paycheck from becoming destitute, bankrupt, jobless, mounting bills and emotional strain. A lone crocus sits on a hillside soon to be in abundance to cover the earth for a short while. Pussy willows emerge. They pr promise the birth of newborn leaves. Melting snow pools in ditches and ponds. Snow geese cover the lakes and sloughs. Others congregate and dot the hillside. Deer, no longer gun shy, traverse the prairie landscape. The city squats quietly, suspended by this arrival. Deer, coyotes, beaver, elk, and wild turkeys roam the streets. The earth will take back what used to belong long before our, our arrival. We will stretch arms, petals greeting the sun, put aside the burdens that have long threatened to bur burrow into our tired souls. And still, we will be filled with how life used to be. Transition. A winter hare hops swiftly, its fur coat a startling contrast in the autumn grass. While in a blistered heel, I stumble. The dark heavens promise rain. The wind cools breath, tosses my hair. The thunder shatters disillusion of a leisurely walk which each step I think of this pandemic, COVID-19, that threatens to erase the slate that chalks the story of our lives. A land gun waltzes on top of the thinning lake ice, dips into the shallow water. Startled prairie grouse twitter as they lift off. Clouds of scattered geese attempt to gather themselves we too will be like that, stitch our lives to this new normal. The, the celestial grandfathers roll beyond our landscape. They take their promise. COVID too will pass. Eventually the rain will come, bring a new life, which will be, we will greet with gratefulness and, and mixed emotions. Emergence. The sun's rays illuminate through the crocus's feather flowery, feathery flower. Having laid doormat for months in the deep darkness of the earth, its unfolding emerges, stretches, and expands its wholeness. Each morning after the slumber of sleep, unaware of the haven of life without light, we too rest. Once in infancy, we curled, orbiting in a wet womb. We too stretched, opened our mouths, soul, life, and wind emerge. We've journeyed through these months of darkness, limbs, mind, soul, and body, a little bruised and battered. Sitting in a darkened sweat lodge, 
the backbones of the grandfather rock glow with the fire within. Water is sprinkled, the clouds vapor dredges the skin. This gestation and germination occurring within the sweat lodge is mere moments of darkness. At labor birth is 15, 28 hours through the uterine passage. To endure, persevere in the gathering of the self, we too will be bruised, battered. The suffering and jubilation will be an exalted breath as we return to greet what lays ahead. This tremendous turbulent lesson of humility, this complicated uncertainty is the first crawl, the first step, this cry back to sun flame, the wind breath sitting in the, on the rock backbone, drinking from the water's vein, life givers, this mystery. A letter, Wakutun, relationship. I'm sorry I haven't been following the music. The music has been the broom where I've swept the debris, mopped footsteps into the future's weight. I've been waiting. I've been writing to the prairie walkers, to the sweat lodge family, in attempt to wake up the inner peace where mystery resides, where darkness dominates like a spreadsheet waiting for some revelation. Yet, even in sleep, the virus finds the holes where it disturbs us, a storm that frightens the semi-awake. I haven't been ignoring you. I've been held by hard-packed snow as it crouches, crunches between, beneath my feet. I've been entertained by the coyotes, the magpies, the ravens, a passing eagle the wide grin of my dog. I've been cooking untried recipes, dreaming of the day when I can see you all. This is for my grandson, Miyogisagal. A curly haired little boy stands stocked still on a red sand beach. His expression is pensive as he watches the waves breathe. The ocean ripples as if to enjoy the tickle, tickle of thoughts. He stands on top a dirty snow mount, looking into the horizon. The future he's witnessing is a prayer that unfolds, a white scroll of untold stories. As he swings a branch, he swings a branch as he walks through the autumn woods and kneels on a log. This little dreamer, a slight smile curved, raising like the sun's rays from the dawn's horizon, smile and sun shimmers through the branches. They carry his knowing. This complete wholeness, this soft footsteps of lightness, where dreams are possible, where dreams live. These two are the destination in this awkward turbulence, in this inheritance, there is hope. A small child skipping, a small child dreaming, a small child waving the wood smoke from the hearth in prayer. All my relations, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to say thank you to everyone who has spoken. It's been a it's been a great morning, and it's um, it's brought great joy to me this morning. I'd also like to welcome all of you who are here. I can't see you, 
but I, I can feel you and it's nice to have a feeling of other people with you in these times. I'd like to start by reading a poem. Um, I wrote it for um, my niece. I, I asked the community to write poems for YYC Pop, Portraits of People. And if you are a student and you want to write one, you can still write one and send it to me from my, from my um, website. Uh, I've decided to extend the project because uh, the Poet Laureate C ending was supposed to be in April and now it's gonna be in October. So um, please, if you're a student, write a poem and send it on over. This is the poem that I wrote to submit to my own book. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's called Feather and it's for my niece. She is the embryo, the nest and the egg. Sometimes she is blue as Robin, other times speckled as Nighthawk. She is an unbroken shell, holds the lifeline of a million tales inside her. And when she cracks open, she tells a spirit story of how to read the earth and tell time and the divine between sun and moon as they align. She speaks in tones of the ley line. Ay, we feel waters cross beneath our feet, held in glory as she speaks. We look into perfection, the reflection of planets and stars on the landscape. And there she hums the whole sky and says, let us learn to fly, aurora borealis in her eyes together. She is the old world and the new, where dreams meet in, in other altitudes, alternative realms. She is the ovum of survival, both tamed and wild, an ology of the beautiful, rare as rapture ground. She is child and she is elder, gives birth as she etches a path for us, dancing with wisdom in pure abandon, iridescent as amylite. She swirls on a carved shillelagh, wind-swept hair in a distinctive hat. Her wings catch the air, all peregrine falcon. She dives into the eternal azure with a maternal cry. She leaves an imprint, like those who trekked the trail of the sky before her. Yes, their songs and stories travel with her, and now they travel with us, a soul feather in the pocket of life. Um, that's kind of a new one. I wrote it last week, so it was fun to read it. And where are we at with time? Oh, pretty good, pretty good. Um, I'm gonna continue rocking forth on my poetry, um, on my poetry quest here. <laughs> and I will read you a poem that I just finished writing. Um, was it yesterday? I think yesterday. And, and so what I realized is in these times, the most important thing to me is love. And so <clears throat> I wrote this called Love in the Time of Corona. I'll just take a sip of water here from my beautiful glass. Cheers. <clears throat> water, loving water. Our faces have changed. We don't yet know what we look like as we search for a new way to live and love. We oscillate between paralysis, monotony, and flow. Wonder if we will ever wake from this COVID coma, if we will ever know anything again. 
Wonder if it will all be a dream, only a dream. Will we only dream of trips to far off places, sitting in stands cheering, standing O's for virtuosos, or dancing wild to Motown Live on a Sunday afternoon? Time changed places with space and dissolved along with the high-paced rat race of our lives, postponed, indefinitely, canceled. Later is the new now. Re-zoom, zoom, zoom. Push the reset button every time we make an expedition into the outside world. Zone in, zone out. Real, try to keep it real, too real to feel, it's, it's unreal. To tell you the truth, it took a pandemic for me to learn to bake a loaf of banana bread. Yeah, I found Grandma Nine's recipe, fashioned the facsimile of a loaf pan, the wrong shape, it turned out the right taste. Each bite of banana bread reminded me of her. Each bite brought me closer to her and the memory of sweeter occasions. A beautiful boon at a time when the only way to touch someone is in their heart, to be touched by tenderness, heart to heart. There will always be another ski pass, another hill, another slope, breath the fresh air, after the age of asphyxiation and despair is behind us. We wonder what will become a thing of the past. Maybe we'll become more human as Earth takes a moment to breathe, as Earth takes a moment to breathe. We wash our hands raw, wear homemade masks, try to learn the perfect distance that might save our own breath. And one day, we might fill that empty space with the beauty of a sunset instead of a pending death. Hmm, six feet above to avoid six feet below. Hmm. One thing's for certain. I had no idea I touched myself so much. <laughs> Hand to hair, sweeping it back, fingers to face, nose and lips, adjusting glasses and the arid eclipse to remove sleep from my eyes. Some days I, I just break down and cry grieving the life I once had, now gone, along with hugs and kisses, shaking hands, freedoms, and long goodbyes. Or those nights when I wake with a little cough and a slight headache, and I think I caught it somehow in isolation, and that's, that's it, the end. And I spend the rest of the night in a cold sweat in a deep tete-a-tete -tete with death. And that's when my heart opens, goes out to the people on the front lines, the ones really taking care. On those days and after those nights, the only thing that comforts me is a potato. I know, it sounds trite. But sometimes the only thing that will lift my spirit is scalloped potatoes, spuds. I think of my other grandma, the poet, who arrived here from Ireland with five cents and a dream of love in her pocket. When she went to spirit, all her writings got lost, scattered to the earth, and all that was left was a locket with a small strand of her hair. 
Today, I follow her dream and turn to the face of love. Today, as I perform a wedding in this time of social distance, my voice breaks on the front lawn under the weeping willow about to bloom in yellow catkins. My breaks, my voice breaks with the blight of beauty at the love I see standing before me beneath long feathery branches over moonstone roots. A young couple ties the knot Hand fasting at a distance, they bind their own hands in the ancestral light of fertility sighs. In this time of pandemic, they speak the vows of their souls in a creation divination that humbles and extols. My body holds back tears as I wed them from afar, I am struck by the closeness of their hearts. The first real day of spring, they are beaming. Global ghosts into dancing light, it swirls around them. And the word Corona returns to its original meaning. Aurora Borealis, solar Soma overhead, their light is likened to a crown. And I say to them, you may kiss with joy. Thank you very much. Namaste. I don't know about you, but my heart is filled. My heart is filled by the words that we have heard, by this opportunity to be together. And what is most on my heart right now is profound gratitude. Gratitude for those who chose to share their wisdom this morning. Those who came to create the community that could hold these words, that could hear these words, that have been touched, all of us, by these words. I find myself remembering a term I heard this week about Mother Nature having sent us to our rooms to think about things. And in my room, I think about the beauty that is around me, as well as the challenges. In the attempt to balance all that we're living through with the fact that love, that force that holds us all, is strengthened in these days. That the opportunities for us to connect with each other, albeit virtually, is strengthening and deepening relationships in ways that we never could have imagined. That possibilities are opening up like having three amazing poets with us this morning. I am filled with gratitude. I invite you to allow your hearts to feel it as well. For it is a great and fiery force. And our director of music, Jane Perry, will introduce our closing song. The final song is indeed, I Am That Great and Fiery Force. Uh, the lyrics were written by the 12th century abbess Hildegard of Bingen. She was a mystic, a composer, a writer, a polymath. The music that accompanies her words was written by Josquin Desprez, who was really a rock star of the Renaissance, a Flemish composer in the 16th century. And uh, the piece has been slightly arranged by a man named Anthony Petty in the 20th century. He was the founder of Calgary Renaissance Singers and Players, which I now conduct in the 21st century. And we will now sing together the words of the 12th century, Abbas Hildegard of Bingen. The words will be on the screen shortly for you.
as we prepare to leave this space and return to our daily lives or the coffee, we are grateful for this time together, for the sacred space we have created. With the extinguishing of our chalice, we now take our intention to offer warmth to others, to be the light to brighten the lives of those in our circle and beyond, to be ourselves agents of love and justice. Recognizing the tiny flame, the pure light within each person is now ours to care for as we extinguish our chalice. And, and now I would ask Jane Perry to offer our closing sung benediction. <laughs> 